Welcome to Inside Analog Photo. I'm your host, Scott Shepard, and the Inside Analog Photography Radio Program is brought to you by Fujifilm, making life more colorful. You know, the instant photography is rocking over at Fuji. You got to check it out. The Instex is in the country. The pack film's rocking, and the mini Instex will be here really soon. Pretty cool stuff. Check them out. www.fujifilmusa.com forward slash professional, making life more colorful. Colorful, our friends at Richard Photo Lab for great development and print work at richardphotolab.com for the unbelievable, gorgeous black and white chrome you're ever going to see. you got to check out DR5 Process. Rocks over there. They do beautiful process, and they also do E6. Check them out, www.dr5.com. Our friends over at Iger Studios. Lenny Iger, the highest quality drum scans with an Aztec premiere. You can get 8,000 PPI. He can adjust aperture and make your film scans look unbelievable. If you're doing a digital intermediate process and you're scanning your analog capture and you want to just have some beautiful, beautiful stuff that you can do a multitude of things with, you definitely got to check out Lenny and his crew over there at igerstudios.com. And our buddy Al over at Upstrap, www.upstrap-pro.com for the camera strap that will not let your camera slide off your shoulder. And of course, our media partners of the Analog Photography User Group. The place on the web for all things analog photography from dry plate, wet plate, film, medium format, 35, large format, ultra format, you name it. It's all discussed over there. Great group of people. Check them out, www.apug.org. we got a great show today. We're going with us, Ron Mowry. Ron is a retired Kodak engineer. He's known on the APUG forums as photo engineer. He is one of the most knowledgeable men ever in the industry that knows about analog photography, about film, about emulsions. He makes his own emulsions. He's making his own paper, their own film. He's got a lot of great stuff going on. And today we're going to talk with Ron about the loss of Kodachrome and the difference between negative, positive, and positive, and positive, and how I'm going to get better photography, and what do I do with the loss of Kodachrome. Ron, how are you doing today? I'm doing just fine. How are you? I'm doing great. Thanks for joining us here on Inside Analog Photo. And Ron, we wanted to chat with you today with your background with engineering emulsions and making film and all of the background you have in photography to talk today about the difference in shooting negatives versus positives, chromes, and your thoughts on the quality of photography that you're going to get based off one or the other. I know for years and years, everybody shot chromes because that's what the magazine wanted. You could project the stuff. But I think technology-wise and what's going on today, you're going to get actually a better image with more latitude based off of negative films. So let's talk about this and why people want to shoot Chrome. Well, you got it exactly right. The editors of magazines wanted to see the image that they were going to print right up front. They wanted to put it on a light table and say, hey, that's the one I want. That's a keeper. And to do the actual printing, though... They had to have masking and make intermediates and so on and so forth to produce all of the correction to get an image that was suitable to print in the magazine. Also, you have to remember that the films that were available back then were all chrome films, Kodachrome, Anska Chrome, and so forth. So there's a history and a tradition of if you want to get your picture published, if you want to get it produced somehow, It's got to be a chrome, but that's not necessarily true. To get just a little bit technical about it, you have to understand that the toe and the shoulder of an image, and you know all films have toes and shoulders, and all print materials have toe and shoulders. The toe and the shoulder represents compression, just like making a JPEG image is compressing the image. The image is compressed, and you hear people say, I'm losing shadow detail. I'm losing highlight detail. Well, the reason they do that is because they are compressing data improperly in technical terms. And you can't get rid of it. It's a part of physics and chemistry. But if you consider a pause-pause system, the toe of the original positive is going to be printed onto the toe of the print material. And the shoulder of the original positive is going to be printed onto the shoulder of the print material. And so what you've got is a double compression. You lose data twice. As a result, many generations of prints lose quality and take on what people call in the motion picture industry a dupey look. So if you look back at an old, old Technicolor film that's been printed over and over and over again, 
It came from a positive original. It's been printed many times. And you end up with this gloriously high contrast image with very little shadow and very little highlight. That's basically it. Now, of course, a lot of people make an objection and say, well, we don't want to make a print. We want to project it. Well, a lot of people object nowadays to setting up all the projection equipment and so forth. In fact, it's very difficult to buy a projector and screen nowadays. And so the positive, positive systems are degenerating into something that is scanned and put onto a video monitor on a computer. So your thoughts on the positive system here, and I think that Kodak specifically has been pushing their new Ektar film as a replacement for an E6 process positive based off of a couple things that are happening these days. And I think that a lot of people are shooting analog, capturing analog when it comes to color. Black and white is a little different story, but I think in color, people are shooting analog and then they're bringing it into a digital intermediary where they can do multiple things with it. That's about the size of it, yes. Now, the problem historically, if you look at the NEGPOS systems, first off, scanning a negative, you don't have the original beside you. And so the original developers of scanner software had a lot of trouble getting their heads around how to scan a negative with that orange mask. And so the original scan negatives didn't look all that great, and I'll admit that. The other thing is that scanned negatives are very often finer grained than what we see because of a problem called aliasing. Let's see, if the individual grains are substantially smaller than the sensor used to scan it, you start to see artifacts that appear as grain in the final image. And that's basically what aliasing is. So there are a number of problems. I might mention another one. Negative films have a pebbly back surface for retouching because they're used so much for portraiture. And this pebbly back, up until recently when Kodak changed theirs and Fuji changed theirs, would show up in the scanning process and it looked like grain. So basically, historically, negatives didn't scan well. But as far as imaging per se, just imaging, negative materials are better because... Number one, they have a straight line portion that can encompass the entire tone scale of the image you want to photograph. The toe and the shoulder of the negative material, if you've shot it right, is outside of the image you just shot. So with the print material, you're only imposing one level of data loss or compression, whereas in pause pause, you're impressing two levels of compression. So the negative positive print system is better than a pause pause print system. In fact, if you go back historically, Kodak developed a complete set of motion picture films using the pause pause methodology, but Hollywood and all other industries rejected it completely because it just could not live up to the special effects, general, generational prints and everything that were needed in the motion picture industry. And way back when, people found out that if you made a transparency from a good color negative, it absolutely knocked the ectochrome or the kodachrome aside. It was so great. And the reason is, and this is another technical problem, ectochromes and kodachromes can only be built to get a D-max between 3 and 4, usually a max of about 3.5. Whereas a negpause print material can be built to get virtually any D-Max you want and virtually any contrast you want. And so I've seen print films that have D-Maxes and tone scale clear up to a density beyond 4.0. Wow. And that's part of your image. You project it on the screen and you get at least, in some cases, a stop more latitude or tone scale on the screen than you get from a pause-pause system. And that just cannot be beat. If you saw them side by side, which I have, it's just awesome. Okay, now let's go to the next stage of the problem. All dyes used in all films, no matter what kind, have impurities. So, for example, a cyan dye has a little bit of magenta color to it and a little bit of yellow color to it. In building a film, that cyan layer has to have a way of removing that yellow tint to it and that magenta tint to it if it's to appear as a correct cyan. In reversal films, the only way to do that is wherever there's cyan dye to retard development, 
in the magenta and yellow layers. Well, since the yellow layer is the furthest one away, it's the hardest one to affect. And so as a result, you have very little color correction in the blue region of the spectrum from a cyan dye. You have some from the magenta. So a reversal film has a limited range of color correction. And this limits its ability to reproduce the original scene accurately with accurate colors. The way they get around it is to jack the contrast of the film up a little bit. And therefore, your eye interprets the increased color contrast as better color reproduction, but it really isn't. Now, in a negative system, you use a masking coupler. So that cyan dye has a little bit of magenta color and a little bit of yellow color associated with it. And when you form cyan dye, you cause that color to disappear. And what you get is a positive, weak, reddish image wherever cyan dye appears that counteracts the negative, weak, reddish image that the cyan dye would normally have and cancels out. It is masked out. And so when you print, you get a very true color. Now, to be honest with you, what they've done with the ectar is jack up the individual contrast a little bit, too, to give the dyes a little bit more punch. So they've done two things. And so the negative system gives you more accurate color, but also more vivid color. That's about all I can say about it. So your thoughts here on, we had this announcement that Kodak, of course, has discontinued Kodachrome after 74 years, 75, whatever you want to call it here. What do you see as a loss for a photographer, or is there even one that they're going to lose anything by not shooting Kodachrome? I mean, of course, you can't put a color neg on a light table and look at it. But hardly anybody develops anything anymore optically. So it's all brought into a digital intermediary. And yes, you're capturing analog and you have this great analog look. Do you see a big demise for photographers with the death of Kodachrome? Well, yes and no. I see a huge loss of goodwill towards Kodak. I don't think Kodak deserves it in this sense, knowing to some extent how difficult it is to sell Kodachrome film. The decision was entirely justified. They just can't move it. They've had such low sales in Kodachrome that the local dealer tells me they've had to return film because it just won't sell. It goes beyond the expiration date, and the customer won't buy it. Or they'll only buy it at a 50% or 80% discount. Now, is that Kodak's fault, or is that the market's fault, you see? It's not Kodak's fault. It's the market. The market doesn't want the product. Yeah, if Kodak could sell Kodachrome, they'd be doing a tap dance. Because, you see, the more profit they get from the Kodachrome, the bigger their sales are. And actually, the percentage of profit that they can invest in digital R&D is greater. And they really do have a lot of good digital properties. People just don't recognize it. I think someone on that thread on APUG mentioned that Kodak has a lot of digital properties that they want to sell or have leased to other companies. So they're losing goodwill, but it's not their fault. And I think people have to realize, too, that Kodak is a company, no matter what engineers or old executives or anybody at Kodak wants to keep something alive, if it's not making money, they're going to kill it. Yes, unfortunately, that's true. And the problem is that the product breakdown at Kodak is such that the reversal films are getting less and less sales themselves overall. So it's not just Kodachrome. It's the E6 family of films in general. They have not put in some of the improvements in the E6 films that they could put in because the market's so small. And so E6 films are an earlier generation of film technology than comparable C41 films. The two electron technology, as far as I know, is not in any E6 film. So there you are. So let's talk about, Ron, yourself. If you're going to go out and shoot color photography, are you going to shoot slide film or color neg? Well, I'm going to shoot color neg. And I'll tell you the reason why. I participated in the comparison test that I've been mentioning to you. I've compared pause, pause systems. I've compared transparencies with neg pause systems. I've been present at presentations from Hollywood producers, directors, and so forth who are using NEGPAW systems and who explain their reasons for wanting them. 
So I switched from all pause pause systems back in about 85 to 88 to neg pause totally. And currently, most of all motion pictures that are shot are shot on neg pause, correct? I would say virtually all of them are. Right. So I guess the thing we lose when we don't shoot chrome, when we don't have chrome color film, is we can't put it on a light table and look at it. Well, let's take that magic light table and transform it into a scanner. Okay. We can place that negative onto a scanner nowadays with one of today's good, high-quality color negative films and have it pop up on a video screen looking as good as it used to on an old slide projector screen. I mean, basically, what is a computer screen? It's a light table. So I have my computer sitting next to my scanner. I put my color negative down, I punch a button, and I get up on my screen a beautiful, positive image. And if it isn't so beautiful, I do what I do in the darkroom. I increase the contrast or increase the saturation, which is like increasing the contrast or saturation by changing development times. There's a 15-second window in making an RA print where you can vary the contrast of the print by 10 or 15%. And there are also tools in the darkroom that you can do to get quite a bit more contrast out of RA print materials. So I can manipulate it either in the darkroom or on the video screen. The difference is I love to work in the darkroom, and I have a lot of fun making prints. Right, but most of the work that you're doing is black and white, correct? Well, that's only because of my emulsion making work. Right. (laughs) Most of my work is black and white, but if you want to look at it historically... I recently counted them, and I have over 1,000 8x10 proof sheets, all in color. Wow. So 90% of my work is color, and that's just color negative. That doesn't include reversal. Now, here's a question for you that a lot of people don't see anymore. Okay, so let's say I analog capture with beautiful color neg film, Ektar, Fuji, whatever. I got some beautiful film. I've shot it. I take it down the lab. They develop it. Now, 10, 20 years ago, Even a mini lab would push light through my color neg into a piece of paper, and I would have an optical enlargement for my nice little Naritsu mini lab, okay? And I would get these beautiful little 4x6 prints back. Now, unfortunately, everything is digital. What's your thoughts on having prints done optically, color neg, negative to positive, versus what you've seen from these current level machines that people would go to, even professional labs, Walgreens, CVS, wherever? Or they have like a Fuji or a Noritsu machine where they scan it and then use a laser to write the image. Have you seen a difference in quality because you have such an immense background in using black color neg work in the darkroom to have an optical print versus a digital color print? That's a very complex question to answer. (laughs) You're kind of giving me a gotcha here because (laughs) I just got back three rolls of film that my wife shot, very beautiful photographs that she shot on a recent trip to Montana. We were out at the formulary. And I took them to our local pro lab, and he did them for me. And I never asked him whether he used a digital printer or not, but I did inspect the prints, and they were beautiful. I got back my negatives in nice glassine envelopes. I got back one proof sheet with all the little contact prints on them, and I got back the individual prints, which looked very good. Now, was it because he used good judgment and a digital printer, or did he use an optical printer? Like I say, I honestly don't know. I never asked him. But I'll have to say this, that on the average, the printer who does digital printing of your analog negatives does a very poor job because they don't know how to set the equipment up. They don't know how to scan it right. They don't know how to set the slope. They don't know how to set what all the knobs are that they've got to twiddle nowadays on the scanner and the printer. But I've seen a lot of very poor prints. The one place that did do it locally here using digital methods, they would turn out good results one day and bad results the next. I've seen some that were green, some that look like scan lines in them. You know what I'm talking about? Sure, banding all kinds of issues, yeah. Yeah, they had all kinds of issues, and it would come and go. Was it the operator? Was it the scanner? Was it the printer? Was it the process itself? The green print also had lines on it, but I couldn't separate out. I knew the lines came from the scanner in some respect or the printer, but I didn't know what the green came from. Was it the printer being set up wrong or was the process out of control? 
So it's very difficult to give you one answer except to say that untrained operators today, people who don't care, the only way to avoid it is to go to a professional lab, and that's what I do. A lot of people have done black and white prints in the darkroom. How much more difficult is it to step up from doing black and white optical prints to color? Uh, It's rather simple. It's a three-step process with a wash, develop, stop, blix, wash. That's it. The only complex step is getting the exposure correct in terms of filtration. Once you've got that pegged down, the color balance is going to be within a 10 filter of that center point for everything you do after that if you do it repeatedly. So if you keep your temperature constant, your times constant and everything, and you say set up your enlarger 12 seconds, F16, one minute development at 50 red, it's going to be within plus or minus 10 red or 5 red for the rest of your life until you burn a bulb out. That's the way it goes. And it's pretty easy. I have turned out, on average, as many as 48 8 by 10s in one evening. That's my max. Wow. That keeps me running. And I go through a gallon or two gallons of developer, and I squeeze my blicks for every drop of capability. Do you think it's really applicable these days that people can do their own color neg work, do their own color development? I mean, yes, you can buy a Jobo on eBay. You can do your own development. It's really economical to take this stuff down and have it run through a machine. Then there's the question, well, with color neg, is it better to run it off of a single-use chemical in a Jobo compared to taking it down to Costco where they run it through a Narizzo or a Fuji developer where it just sucks the film in and who knows what's going to come out the other end? What's your thoughts on the criticalness of developing C41 color neg yourself? Are you better doing it with a one-shot chemical like a Jobo? Or does it really matter and just take it down to the drugstore and let them develop it? It depends on the quality of the film you get back from your drugstore. Even my professional lab failed me once with a roll of 120 film. It came back all scratched. But 99% of the time, they do a terrific job. So I would have to say it depends on the lab you take the C41 film to. Now, as far as prints go, you can only get a snapshot-type print, the 3x4 or 4x5 But what if you want a custom print? That's what's becoming hard to get. I have boxes of 8x10s here that I do custom. And that's where it becomes fun. You see, because I do photography not because it's a labor, but because it's fun. So I'll make an 8x10, but I will dodge, crop, do whatever I need to do to get just the print I want. I can even do color balance changes. But the average printer at Costco or wherever you take it, is not going to do custom work for you and won't do the enlargements, at least very easily. So I guess it is sad that Kodachrome has passed, but there's alternate things that you can do now to make beautiful color prints. And I mean, what's your thoughts on the current stock of Kodak and Fuji and everybody else's color chrome film? Well, as I said, the chrome films are about a generation behind the negative films. Fuji has released a new generation of chrome films that lack that extra layer for fluorescent lighting. There's been discussion about that. Well, now I take that back. I'm not sure that they've done it in their chrome films yet. I'm not sure which films they've done it in, but they've changed the layer structure. There's not too much research going forward on it. I have worked with some Fuji color negative film recently, and it's very nice film. They have an 800-speed film that is second to none. Kodak does, too, and I've used both of them side-by-side, printed them side-by-side, and I'm perfectly satisfied with the results from both of them. They have a different color palette, a different grain structure, a different sharpness limit depending on magnification. But, gee, at 800-speed, a four scene of something, a waterfall, some of them that I've taken have looked pretty doggone decent. So I think negative films are advancing. If Kodak puts two electron sensitization into 800 film, we'll see a big jump forward there. I don't know what Fuji has in store, but I know they've got some new films under development because I had a chance to have dinner with Dr. Tani in 2006 when he was in Rochester. He and Paul Gilman and I had dinner together, and he was telling me about a new color film that they had under development. It may have come out, but I did take some pictures with his camera of he and his group of researchers who came to visit Rochester. So research goes forward on all fronts. 
I talked to the inventor of two electron sensitization at that same dinner and then talked to the guy who was coding the color negative film that it was unnamed at that time. So I don't know whether he was working on the Portra or the Ektar, but he was working on it. I know him and I went over and spoke with him. So I know that research is going forward at both Fuji and Kodak on new generations of color film and also of new black and white films. Ron, let's talk about here real quick what you're up to, how people can find out what you're doing. I know that you're working on some formulation. You're working on your book, the DVD. you got a lot of cool stuff going on. How do people find out what Ron's up to and how they can actually see what you're doing? Well, I'm so busy answering questions from people that I don't have a website. I just don't have time to maintain it. If they want to send me a note, they're welcome to send an email to me. I'd be glad to answer their questions. I answer every email. I have, well, you saw it. You saw the book, the draft of it. I have. It's beautiful. When people are going to be able to get their hands on this, they're going to be very lucky. Well, in any event, you saw the draft copy. That was draft three. Draft four was just completed, and it contains the engineering drawings of the coding blades, which you also saw when we had lunch together. So it also contains two additional sections, and the book and the DVDs were reviewed by Kirk Kias on APUG. He and several others suggested two additional sections to include more information on how Kodak coats and how Kodak makes emulsions. And I'm considering how to do that and how much I'm going to have to go back to Kodak and discuss with him about it, too. There is that. As far as emulsions go, I have developed an emulsion that tests out at about 100 speed. The problem is that it's a little foggier than I like, and it has a lot of solarization. And I've been flailing around here trying to figure out how to reduce the solarization. This is going to take a little bit of playing with metal salts in there. And I don't know if I really want to hand that over to people. So what I want to do is to try and eliminate it as far as possible by means that don't introduce a lot of darkroom manipulation. I want to try and make it as simple as possible. So that's what I'm working on is 100-speed emulsion. I've penciled out the outline of how to make 400-speed emulsion, but it is going to take pump to deliver it because I just don't see any way for a person to deliver the needed ingredients with the needed accuracy. So that's where I am, a 400-speed emulsion that will have to be pumped. Of course, the Azo emulsion is pretty much put back on the shelf because I know how to make it, I know how to stabilize it, I know how to control the contrast, that's it. I've got a four-grade emulsion formula set in the book for the Azo emulsion. For the Bro Vera coated bromide type, I have a two- or three-grade emulsion set there. These are all cold-tone to neutral-tone papers, except for one. I have a warm-tone Azo. That's about where I am right now. Ron, why don't you explain to people about this Azo And what's the difference in an azo emulsion technology compared to just a traditional black and white paper, which you might find that you can't really get this azo stuff anymore. So why don't you tell people why this is cool? Okay, well, an azo emulsion is, first off, five to ten stops slower than a traditional enlarging paper. So you can work with it in very bright conditions, very bright, safe light, almost dim room light, although I don't recommend it. But you can work with a very, very bright safe light. It is basically a pure chloride emulsion. It can be made with a very soft toe and soft shoulder so that when you make a print from a regular negative, you can see further into the toe and shoulder and you get more highlight and shadow detail. Photographers that know how to take advantage of that can make the best of an ASO paper. Very often, this is brought out by using special developers, like Amidal developers, and by long soak in water after the development step to allow the toe and shoulder to gradually come up. I build my own paper with a soft toe built right into it. And so, therefore, anybody that starts out printing doesn't have to do anything special. They get the highlights pop right up on them. And many people have come to me and said, I can't believe this. I didn't have to dodge this or soak it, or anything after development. I get the detail in the highlights right there. 
No, I've seen the sample prints that you've made with your paper that are incredible. Yeah, that's the thing. You've seen how smooth they are and everything, how good the tone scale looks, and you've seen the enlarging paper, too. So you've seen all the comparisons. Now, I guess the question is, is when can we buy packs of paper? Well, I don't intend to go into production, but someday you might see the Azo emulsion for sale because it's so easy to make that you may see a company making it in half kilo or kilo lots. You might see them make it in different contrast grades. This emulsion is extremely simple to make. It is a pure chloride emulsion. It has about six ingredients, and it takes me from start to finish a half hour to make it. This is Uh, great work. So we look forward to, of course, seeing more of your work. And I guess the best place people can get a hold of you is just to contact you through APUG. So if they go to APUG.org, they can just look for Photo Engineer, and they'll find you. Yep, I'm there, and I try my best to be on every day. Ron, I really appreciate you joining us today, talking about the difference between negative, positive, 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 and yes, we're mourning the loss of Kodachrome because it's been a great emulsion. It's a great film. It's historically not available anymore, but ideally you can still make beautiful color photography using Color Neg and actually get better results. So I just really appreciate your work, all the time you spend, and APUG in the forums and answering these people's questions. And just great work that you're doing. Ron, thank you so much. Oh, you're quite welcome, Scott. See you later. Well, there you go. Ron Mowry, photo engineer, all-around great guy, one of the most knowledgeable people on the planet about analog photography. And, of course, you can find out more information about Ron. Just go over to APUG, A-P-U-G dot org, and look for photo engineer. Ron's got his fingers on all kinds of great stuff over there. Really great guy, really knowledgeable. And you got to just read what he's been posting. He's a wealth of information, and you really got to utilize what he's been telling people. Good stuff. And, of course, the Inside Analog Photography Radio Program has been brought to you by Fujifilm, making life more colorful over at www.fujifilmusa.com forward slash professional. Our friends over at Richard Photo Lab for great C41, cool stuff going on, www.richardphotolab.com. Our friend David Wood over at DR5 for the most fabulous black and white chrome on the planet. Beautiful process. Check them out, dr5.com. And Lenny Iger over at Iger Studios. If you're looking for the finest quality Aztec Premier Pro drum scan on this planet, these guys rock. you got to check them out, igerstudios.com. Upstrap Al over at upstrap-pro.com for Upstrap, the finest quality camera strap known to mankind. Your camera will not slide off your shoulder. they got straps for laptop bags. For any kind of bag. I mean, it's just a really great product. I use it on everything I have. I've never, ever, ever, ever had a camera slide off my shoulder anywhere. Even being horizontal, almost tripping on my face. Good stuff. Upstrap-pro.com. And of course, our media partners of the Analog Photography User Group over at www.apug.org. I've been your host, Scott Shepard, here on Inside Analog Photo. We'll be back next week with more great analog photography.